morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, for any of you who are visiting with us, who are new to our service, a very special welcome. Uh, my name is Ian Reed. Uh, Reverend Rick is away this week. If anybody's been following his Facebook posts, he's having a wonderful time in New York City. Uh, for any of you who are visiting and all the rest of you, I hope you will join us across the hall in the upper hall for a time of coffee, tea, and fellowship immediately following the service. Among the announcements, as you may have seen on the sign on the door, there is our uh, Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper here on Tuesday in the lower hall between 4.30 and 6.30. Uh, as you might know, it was traditionally a feast right before the fasting that would start at the beginning of Lent. I don't think that we're going to be likely fasting too often, but that was the history. Hope you can uh, join us in the lower hall on Tuesday evening. And uh, the following day on Wednesday is our brief Ash Wednesday service at 7 p.m. Ash Wednesday marks the harbinger of Lent, the very beginning of this 40, 40 days of the Lenten season as we prepare for uh, Easter. Uh, are there any other? I think, Joan, you had an announcement, yes? Good morning. Um, I just wanted to say a quick word about the book study you may or may not have seen the uh, announcement about in the church at work. Um, and I'm in, in keeping with the famous St. Luke's tradition of going, I have an idea that, about a book you might enjoy reading, Rick. Um, I got, he read the book and then he said, Joan, why don't we lead a book study? <laughs> So, yeah, in this church, if you express an idea, you sometimes end up with a task. But anyway, um, the, the book, <laughs> the book, the book uh, was something that I managed to come across uh, after a, a United in Learning webinar that I watched during COVID when none of us could do anything. And, and uh, like many of you, I was fretting about what's going to happen to churches when we, you know, during a lockdown and and afterwards um, but in any case a lady that uh, is from Winnipeg did a sabbatical and uh, I think she started her work prior to COVID but went through across the country looking at churches that were thriving in spite of the challenges over the last uh, decade or more and churches seeing diminished enrollment and things and to not do too much of a spoiler um, the, the conclusion she came to was that churches that were thriving aren't thriving because they have an increasing membership or really exciting programs or lots and lots of money. Uh, they seem to be thriving because of the values that they hold dear and discerning uh, their place in their communities and uh, developing their, their uh, purposes and, and actions uh, that come from that. So what I'm encouraging you to do is, is to think about whether you want to uh, engage in the reading of the book with us. Uh, the, the book study goes for the first, uh, starts the March the 6th, the first Monday in March, and goes for five Mondays. And I'm going to tell you, I'm making an executive decision, Rick, wherever you are, that you don't even have to read the book ahead of time. You can just come because we're going to uh, basically take chapters uh, of, uh, one or two at a time and uh, discuss things. And it's more about uh, sharing uh, values and, and maybe dreams you might have for your church family or what you might like to see happen over the next period of time. And uh, anyway, I'm just inviting you all to come. It'll be a time of fun and fellowship and some, some time to think about some things together that we don't intentionally make time to do. And uh, anyway, that's it. <laughs> yes. You may. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Christopher. I think everyone I know yeah, if there's new people here, any new faces. Uh, I just wanted to draw your attention, uh, thanks to Elaine for including this in the office, sorry, in the, what's it, how are you, Mel? Church at work. It. Thank you, church at work. 
Uh, as was revealed at the AGM, uh, there is some language wordsmithing that needs to be done by our wonderful affirming community for everyone to feel that our statements are inclusive of all things that are St. Luke's. So I have uh, reiterated what I said at the mic last week. If you weren't here, please check out the email. It basically invites you to share your thoughts and comments to my email, which is also noted on the uh, email, to share any thoughts that you have, uh, because we cannot move forward by representing you unless you represent yourself. So please take some time, if, you, if it's something in your heart space that you'd like to do, to read it over. If there's some things that are missing for you, please feel free to uh, share those comments and those observations, which I will uh, welcome and acknowledge receipt of once I receive them, and we'll bring that to our next discussion at our next affirming meeting. So thanks so much. To follow up with that, I, many of you may have seen this, but if you haven't, this is the call and the, the icon for the United Church for the next decade. And, and it, it consists of only six words, but incorporated in all of in those six words, I think you can find almost anything will fit in terms of what we do as a church. Uh, so I would, uh, want this to be shown just to bring this to your attention uh, to give you uh, a little visual example of the dimensions of the United Church life. And uh, uh, as the deliberations continue on, uh, on revising our mission and vision statements and possibly informed by the, work, by the uh, book study that Joan was describing, I think uh, I'm quite optimistic that we will have one uh, a vision statement that will truly reflect everything that we really feel we are all about. Uh, before we begin our service, I would wish again to confirm that we stand on land that is the unceded territory, ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and we commit to remaining in friendship, respect, and peace together. Christ said, I come into the world as light, so whoever believes in me will not remain in darkness. Let us light our Christ candle to be a symbol of the light of his presence among us this morning. Now, put your feet on the floor, your hands on your lap, close your eyes, and take a few slow breaths in and out as you sense your presence here in the sanctuary. As we hear the sounds of the singing bowl, let's shed our worries of today and open our hearts and for a little while, Let's allow God's love and peace into our hearts. Now you can open your eyes and join me in the call to worship. Holy mystery, holy love, we celebrate your presence in our words and in our witness. One on whom our hearts rely. Open our hearts to compassion. Open our lives to inspiration. Open our lives to service. May our time together be a blessing. So be it. Amen.
I'm going to tell you a story. Actually, I'm going to tell all of you a story because there are people who are nice and young who are with us, and there are people, the rest of us, who hopefully on most days are young at heart. Um, so I'm going to ask you all to answer that. I'm going to get you to all uh, consider answering the questions. I'm not going to, not going to pin it down on, on, uh, on just a few people. So hands up if you have ever been afraid. Ah, okay. What makes you afraid? Jay, what makes you afraid? Yes, financial stress. What else makes what el what makes any of the rest of you a bit afraid? Fear. Uncertainty. Uncertainty. Sure. Fear of not succeeding. Yes, fear of failure. Sure. Snakes and spiders. Snakes <laughs> and spiders. Yes, I know at least one person who can't even look at a picture of a snake. <laughs> Well, when I was quite young, I was afraid of the dark. Hands up if at any time in your life you were afraid of the dark. Boy, you guys are pretty brave. Ah, ha, ha. Uh, we have a, fr we have, a yes, yes. And, and, uh, and in fact, um, well, what's this? A nightlight. Hands up if you ever had a night light. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, some, some, some of us have it because we're afraid of the dark. Some of us have it to make sure we get to the bathroom in the nighttime. <laughs> okay. Well, I can tell you that when I was your age, I was afraid of the dark, and I had a night light. And in fact, I had to have the door in my bedroom open a little crack too. And the hall light had to be on because I, wa I was just a little afraid that I was by myself. Remember when we had the Hurricane Fiona back just a few months ago, back in the fall? Do you remember that? When the winds blew and the rain pelted down and trees were falling down. Do you remember some of that? Yeah, did trees fall down around your house? Did you? Well, I can tell you, we lost about six. Uh, fortunately, they didn't land on anything, but it was scary. Yes, and I was a little scared. Were you a little scared during that storm? No, you weren't scared. Yeah, well, when the power went out and the lights went out and it was dark, it was just a little bit scary. Okay. When you are scared, what helps you? What helps you? Light. Light? Yeah. yeah. Anything else that helps you when you're scared? Let me ask you this. If you're all by yourself, is it worse when you're scared? Yeah. So what else helps you, when, helps you get over being a bit scared? Someone. Having someone with you. Yeah, and I remember very well when I was scared at night, maybe I was having a bad dream or something, and my mom or my dad would come into the room, and sometimes they would lie down beside me. Hands up if you have ever had one of your parents lie down beside you because you were scared in bed when you were little. Yes, yes, yes. Well, God is a bit like that. God is always with us. And we really are never totally alone. So when we're scared and we don't have someone else with us, God is also with us. God helps us just like our mom and our dad did when they crawled in beside us to make us feel like we were going to be okay. So let's uh, have a little prayer together, and I'm going to ask everyone to repeat after the, each phrase after I say it, okay? Dear God, help me to remember that whenever there are dark, stormy nights, when we are scared, that you are always with us. 
So we don't have to be afraid. So we don't have to be afraid. Amen. This next hymn uh, is not necessarily familiar to everyone. Uh, it's a lovely melody, which the choir will be supporting you with singing unison. So I'll invite you to stand as you're able. Uh, choir, actually, just uh, I'll give you a cue so you're not listening. I'm going to play the whole tune through just so you can hear this beautiful melody. So, choir, as I get to the last phrase, you can stand up rousingly and the congregation will fall. <laughs> hear what I said there? Rousingly. reading today is from Matthew chapter 17. This gospel passage from Matthew tells of a milestone event where disciples see a par powerful confirmation of Jesus as God's son and a hint of heavenly life to follow. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzlingly white. Suddenly, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and, the cloud, uh, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. In this passage from Paul's letter to Corinthians, he reassures them that the resurrection is for them as it was for Jesus. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be representing God, because he te we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. 
For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Susan. There are plenty of things that we might be afraid of today. You would probably wouldn't have much trouble coming up with a list. Maybe you are worried about your finances, about inflation. Maybe you're afraid about what lies ahead for your children and your grandchildren as we face a climate crisis. Maybe, maybe you're afraid of the disruption in our world order arising from the war in Ukraine. Perhaps for ourselves, we are worried about declining health and what aging might do to us in the future. There's almost, there's something we almost never discuss. It's not an easy topic, but I'll do the best I can with you this morning. We almost never discuss our own death. We all have some fear about death, or at least some uncertainty about what happens to us and what lies beyond. Many of us fear the actual dying process even more than actually being dead. Fortunately, with advances in palliative care medicine, most people have good pain and symptom control and can maintain some quality of life to the end. And with recent access to MAID, some can exert control over their final days of life if it becomes intolerable. In the passage from Corinthians that Sue read so well this morning, Paul is addressing the people's uncertainty about their own resurrection. This was despised, despite their knowing that Christ himself was raised from the dead. But what about for them? The Apostle Paul had personal eyewitness experience of Christ's life after death when he encountered him on the road to Damascus. Paul, therefore, had no doubt that this was true. He also knew that this wasn't just for Christ alone, but that eternal life was offered to everyone. Death was a transformation, a moment before a passage into a new life. It was not the end to our existence. In this morning's gospel reading, uh, from Matthew, Peter, James, and John, the three fishermen, went to the mountaintop with Jesus. They saw visions of a great, almost blinding light surrounding him, and they heard the voice of God affirming that Jesus was God's beloved son. It was terrifying for them. They hid their eyes. Yet, when Jesus reached down and touched them, comforted and reassured them, they were no longer afraid. They had seen a vision of what was to come. Jesus was the Son of God. They were then convinced that they could trust what Jesus said to them about the future, about heaven and eternal life. In our world, it's dominated by science, flooded with information, we develop our own personal sense of what is real. 
What we believe to be real is defined and often limited to what we see, what we hear, what we read, and what we experience. Fortunately, though, once in a while, when we pause for a moment, possibly looking at a spectacular sunset or a beautiful flower, or when we see the smile and the, hear the innocent laughter of a child, we can for a moment be transcended and touch the divine. For a moment, we feel a sense that our fragile faith is indeed real and valid. When we're faced with the impending end to our lives, we make a dramatic change in the order of our priorities. Suddenly, most things that we used to worry about become small things. And the big things become the relationships with those whom we love. For some, giving and accepting forgiveness becomes an important remaining task. Some people are so close to our hearts that every minute that we spend with them is precious. No one worries any longer about the size of their retirement savings or current political matters. For most of us, in the quiet, reflective moments alone, some simple yet profound and troubling questions come to mind. What happens at the moment when I die? Do I feel anything? What happens next? Will I ever be connected again with those whom I love? Will I just be lost in endless darkness and silence? Will I just simply cease to exist? Will I be forgotten? These are troublesome thoughts, thoughts we all avoid and have avoided for years. For the eyewitnesses like Paul and the other disciples and the over 500 other people who encountered the risen Christ, they knew the answers. They knew that death is not the end of our existence. For us today, some compelling information comes from the thousands of credible, reported, near-death experiences found in hundreds of books, videos, interviews, and some published peer review articles. These profound experiences share some remarkably common elements. People report a, a sense of loss of control, being out of their body and seeing it below as physicians are working on it. But surprisingly, they consistently describe a pleasant, relaxed, stress-free feeling, a feeling of peace. They feel no fear. They feel no anxiety. They may report a vague awareness of seeing a new journey ahead on the horizon towards a new existence. In all cases, these people's lives are profoundly changed. Well, what about our human body? Do we need it anymore? During the time before Jesus ascended into heaven, he appeared to the disciples who were hiding together in fear. They recognized him by seeing his wounded hands and feet. Later, though, before he ascended into heaven, we know when Christ appeared, he was changing and was not immediately recognized. When Jesus met Peter, James, and John on the seashore, they did not recognize him. Not until they followed his instructions 
cast their nets on the other side of their boat, finding an abundance of fish, did they realize who this man was. Jesus' appearance was changing. After a career in medicine, I do not believe that our withered bodies do anything but return to the dust from whence they came. Let's face it, when my life on earth is over, I really don't want to inhabit this worn out body that I have had for many years, uh, or maybe at least I could hope to have one like I had when I was 21. When I was a first year medical student, I spent over 100 hours in an anatomy lab studying human anatomy. In the lab, there were the bodies of people who had willed their remains to the medical school. Before we entered the lab, the university chaplain led us in prayer to express our gratitude and respect for these donations. At the age of 19, having only seen a few dead bodies, I was quite apprehensive. Upon entering the lab, however, and seeing the bodies, it was clear to me immediately that although they were human bodies, they were not people anymore. They were cold and without any spirit. A fundamental axiom of science is the conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created and it cannot be destroyed. It can only change in its form. Many people attest to a sense of an aura of energy around each one of us. Some have actually measured it. My wife, Joan, spent 25 years as a palliative care physician. Many times she experienced what I have also witnessed while at the bedside of someone at the moment of their passing. Surrounded by family and often medical personnel, after that final breath, for a few moments, there's a continued presence in the room that I can only describe as energy or spirit, if you will. You can feel it, but it's transient. And as the body changes and takes on the appearance of death, that energy dissipates as if it flew out the window. The body resembles the person, but it isn't the person anymore. Scripture reassures us that death is not the end, but a new beginning we are reassured by Christ's own words and the experiences of his disciples and many others. We're soon to enter the season of Lent as we begin the journey to the cross and then to Easter and the resurrection. It's the most sacred time of the Christian year. It's heralded by Shrove Tuesday, and then Ash Wednesday, this week. Unlike the humankind before Christ, we have the knowledge, the confidence, and the assurance of our life beyond death. Let us not be afraid. Thanks be to God. Before, <laughs> sorry to take you out. Before we do the offering, I'm just going to take a couple of moments, if I may. This is off script, just to share something. Do you mind? Um, thank you for your beautiful words, Ian. Um, I don't know. Sometimes the moment the spirit moves. So I've been with this community for two years. And some of you might jokingly have noticed that I have this lovely scar in my throat. It's actually a trach scar. And I say otherwise that I used to call it my necky button or it's my belly button because I've had so many facelifts. 
Uh, I have lived with HIV since I was uh, in 2020, no, sorry, am I saying 2002, I was diagnosed as HIV positive and live a vibrant life now as an undetectable man. In 2007, I was in a very challenging marriage and I was taking care of a adoptive daughter who was 11 years old at the time and was stricken with a lifetime of trauma with crack addicted parents. Everything that I'm about to account for you could have been medically avoided because the medical technology existed for me not to take this journey. But the spiritual journey is that my marriage was so toxic and the family that I had created with my husband and my adoptive daughter could not be sustained. It couldn't. And my ego was so big that I wasn't going to give it up until my higher spiritual self said, you know what, you need to take a little break to get some objectivity. So I share the dramaticism of this because I am dramatic to connect it directly to what Ian said. So in November of 2007, I was in the middle of teacher's college. I did not take care of my HIV status. I invested in real estate in Egypt called Denial. And I uh, got a form of pneumonia, which was an AIDS voluntaristic illness called uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. I had seven white blood cells in my body and full-blown AIDS. And I was uh, medically induced into a coma for three weeks. They intubated me and extubated me three times. I failed all three times, which is why they traked me. Of course, I'm a professional singer, right? So not only is this your expressive center, I'm a singer, and this is, I wasn't speaking my truth. So my truth was the very thing that was compromised. My right lung collapsed. I almost went into cardiac twice. And my dear mother, who had already lost my only sibling, and again, this is doom and gloom, but I want to bring this to a very positive place. My only, my only sibling, 15-year-old brother, was killed by a drunk driver in an accident. My mother and I were in in 1985, so I was 11 years of age. So my mother had already seen her first child leave this earth and, of course, was very protective of me. And when I came out to her and said, Mom, I'm a gay man, she's like, I accept you for being gay, but you're coming out into this world with this thing that exists in your community that takes lives, which was HIV. I was in a relationship and didn't know that I would take a souvenir away, took it to its full fruition, and now there's my mother, who many of you have met, standing over my body, being melodramatic in a coma. As you can see, I came out of the coma. And my mother said, if you do that again and don't die, I'll kill you myself. <laughs> but while I was in that coma, my 15-year-old brother was right there with me. And all these experiences that Ian described, don't know if it's Oprah-induced, if it's, if it's Dr. Phil, but I wanted to share this because we can speak of this conceptually, and I wanted to impart this to you in a very anchored way from someone who's right here in front of you. I live with HIV now as if I live with diabetes. People take insulin, I take a pill the size of a multivitamin that keeps me alive and vibrant. I've got some wonderful war wounds to remind me of my mortality, but I was right on the cusp. And I remember at the time that I was dying, that I had a choice. At the time, the biggest thing that anchored me to this earth was that I wasn't done with my daughter. My daughter was still in a very vulnerable place and I needed to be there to support her. That's my consciousness. But my 15-year-old brother stood there in this energy, bathed in light with his hand outstretched to say, here I am, and this is for you if you need to take it. You don't have to, but I want you to know that I'm right here. So I too saw my energy from above. I experienced that. It, it, it's, it, and I don't fear death. I fear how to die. I don't want to burn to death. I don't want to freeze to death. I don't want to suffer. But death, as I understand it in my spiritual Christian being, is something that is, just as Ian said, it is a, it's a transformation of energy. This is just a, a well-preserved candy wrapper. Um, this is the container in which our souls live, our vibrant thing. You know, this is the vibrancy of who we are as a community. We do have a shelf life as beings, as physical beings, but not as spiritual beings. So I just wanted to share with you that I dropped a big bomb here that my mother's going to say, wow, Chris, that was a lot for St. Luke's on the video. Um, this is the reality. Someone who went through all this craziness, you know, and has come back from the dead, still high kicking. So, yeah, just know that, that um, what you spoke was so rooted in truth for me that I just felt it was important for me to share that vulnerability to let all of you know who I'm in the room with right now. This happened to me. And I'm still queer and here. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you.
it, under, it underscores how <laughs> we really need to be willing to let mystery and wonder enter our lives and not think that we know, understand, have measured and quantified and explained everything. So Elaine, because I miscommunicated with you, this is not the anthem we're doing today. That was my bad on the one note. You're a rock star. Please, it's me. It's all me. So we're going to sing an anthem, which I'll invite the choir to stand up and take their position. Uh, it's called We Are One Body, which is not correlative with what's up there. So yeah, just leave it there, handsome sir. We'll just leave it on that slide. And I'll invite you. The words are, we are one body, one body in Christ. We do not stand alone. There it lies. We are one body. We are collective, whether we are in Syria, in Turkey, whether we are in the Ukraine, or whether we're in St. Margaret's Bay. to take action now to become anti-racist. I'm chatting with Adele Halliday, the United Church's anti-racism and equity lead about why and how your activism and your generosity through mission and service are making a difference. 
really good to be with you, Adele. Thanks, Alexa. It's good to be here with you, too. What is the church's role and you know, mission and services support that helps church communities come to that now what? What are we, what are we doing as a church in, in terms of that kind of work? Maybe I'll just talk about the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism, which is something I'm so excited about. <laughs> this is a 40-day program designed within, by us in the United Church, for people in the United Church and beyond that moves people through a journey. The daily re written reflections engage people through a time of learning, uh, a faith reflection, and an idea for action. There are live events where people can come, participate, engage with some of the authors and people involved in the broader community. Um, there's discounts for the United Church Bookstore and lots of study groups and other ways that people can become involved. So that's one tangible example. One program completely developed, supported by Mission and Service for people in the United Church, but that actually has had a global reach. Another person talked about how they picked up a resource um, that we in the United Church had developed, Mission and Service Funds, read it through, really thought about it, prayerfully reflected and said, I want to make changes in my worship service. And they started to implement anti-racism elements in their worship. One of the important pieces of work that the church has done recently is make the declaration to become an anti-racism church. I wonder if you can speak a little bit about that. In October 2020, the General Council of the United Church of Canada made a commitment to becoming an anti-racist denomination. It was about becoming, right? It's not that we are, it's not that we've done it, it's a becoming, so a kind of a journeying towards uh, in all of our different ways, journeying together, staff, people of faith, all of us thinking about how we can become um, an anti-racist denomination over time in the long term. Your gift for Mission and Service will help support programming as we work to be an anti-racist denomination in the long term. And, uh, I think most of us would like to think that we are not racist, but there, yeah, that's a very passive situation position to be in. To actually be anti-racist is proactive, it's engaged, uh, it's making a sincere effort to look at the, where the racism exists and do what we can to eliminate it. So being anti-racist is a calling. So I would encourage you, uh, just Google United Church Anti-Racism and you will see some of these resources, which I think you'll find quite interesting. Thank you, Ruthann. We've had heard the word. We've heard some of the challenges. Now it is our time to respond with our offering. And I invite all of you to share some of God's abundance. God, we rejoice and give thanks for all that has been given and return a portion of it to meet the needs here in our community and elsewhere through our mission and service fund. So during the uh, taking up of the offering, the choir will be singing uh, a very short uh, melody and it's entitled, Do Not Be Afraid. It's actually from More Voices 90. Choir, with your blessing, I'll sing the first verse as a solo and then I'll invite you to join me on the second verse and we'll do it three times both times, second and third time in harmony. Don't be afraid, my love is stronger stronger than your fear. Don't be afraid. My love is stronger and I have promised, promised to be always
can I do? What can I do? What can I bring? What can I bring? What can I say? What can I sing? I'll sing with joy. I'll sing with joy. I'll sing a Please join me in a few moments of prayer. Dear God, we share with you the anguish over the suffering that we see in our world. We are so saddened by the tremendous loss of life from the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Daily images of the tireless work of those trying to rescue and recover the lost is an inspiration. We're moved when even now we see the miraculous finding of survivors. We see their profound grief and the nearly insurmountable task ahead of rebuilding their lives. God, we're now entering the second year of the pointless war in Ukraine with no sign of peace ahead. Keep us aware of the needs of these people as they struggle to survive in unimaginable circumstances. God, guide and motivate us to do what we can to help these people you love. We also have some things that are causing us pain or great worry. We know that you are always there to provide comfort, that we are never alone. Some of us have illnesses ourselves or in our loved ones. Please give us and those we love the strength to strive for healing, healing our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. We take now just a moment to privately share those for whom we have the greatest concern. We have much action to be happy about and grateful for God. We now just take a moment to share some of those things for which we are most grateful. We ask that you hear our prayers and hold us in your ever-present arms as we pray together the prayer your son Jesus taught us. Our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
go now without fear, knowing that we are never alone in this life and the next. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, surround you and those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen.